seated. Good evening. I'm Stephen Friedman, the Provost of Fordham University, and I will serve as the Master of Ceremonies for this evening's event. To all here present, our distinguished honoree is Beatitude, Anastasios, Archbishop of Tirana, Duras, and all Albania, His Eminence, Archbishop Demetrios, Ms. Gross, Father McShane, honored guests, faculty, students, friends, we extend a cordial welcome to the 2014 Orthodoxy in America Lecture and Honorary Degree Ceremony for Archbishop Anastasios. It is now my pleasure to introduce the President of Fordham University, Reverend Joseph M. McShane of the Society of Jesus. Archbishop Anastasios, Your Eminence, Archbishop Demetrius, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, and members of the Fordham family, it is a great joy and a great grace for me to welcome you all to this ceremony, at which we will both recognize the many contributions that his Beatitude has made to the life and ministry of the Orthodox Christian community, both in Albania and throughout the world, and to welcome him into the Fordham family by bestowing upon him an honorary doctorate. As I welcome his beatitude to the Fordham fold, I wonder if I might offer a few reflections on both the strong and loving relationship that binds the Orthodox and the Fordham families together, and on the interest and timing of our ceremony this evening. With regard to the former, your beatitude. You should know that Fordham considers itself blessed to be the second home and the intellectual home in America for the Orthodox community. We really are. I say that with all the humility that my Jesuit nature will allow me. <laughs> Thanks to the hard work of two remarkable faculty members, the generosity of many benefactors, and one I must name individually this evening, Mr. Michael Chaharis, a great friend of the university. And with the blessing of our dear friend, Archbishop Demetrius, Fordham is proud to be the home of the only Orthodox Studies program in the United States. Therefore, our ties to the Orthodox community are warm, deep, and broad. With regard to the timing of our ceremony this evening, let me offer two reflections, if I might. Your beatitude. Although we gather to honor you on a bitterly cold winter evening here in New York, your presence among us suffuses the university with warmth and fills our heart with the same warmth. Second, Providence has supplied us with a particularly appropriate and a particularly ecumenical feast on which to welcome you and to shine a spotlight on your life and your ministry. Allow me to explain. Today, during the first year in the pontificate of a Jesuit pope with a Franciscan name, the Roman Church observes and celebrates the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, known in our heritage as the Angelic Doctor. This coincidence creates a marvelous ecumenical moment. Think of it. On this day, during the pontificate of Pope Francis, on the feast of a great Dominican theologian saint, St. Thomas Aquinas, Fordham, the Jesuit University of New York, honors an Orthodox Archbishop. Surely the saints and angels are rejoicing at this dem demonstration of the essential unity of the Church. I refer, of course, to the fact that Jesuits are celebrating a Dominican saint. <laughs> Although on first blush this coincidence may seem only to be frivolous, on deeper reflection it offers us a way of understanding and celebrating your most remarkable life and ministry more fully and I believe in a proper light. After all, like Thomas, 
you are a theologian. Therefore, you have devoted your whole ministerial life to the great and greatest work of plumbing the depths of the Christian tradition. Like Thomas the theologian, you have also sought ways to bring the fruits of your study to bear on the life and mission of the church in a world that is both enriched by and challenged by the currents of the age. Like Thomas, you have read the gospel in the context of the signs of the times and the events of the age in the context and in the light of the gospel. Unlike Thomas, however, you have had to perform your ministry, ministry in the particularly challenging context of a nation and of a church, struggling to find new ways forward after a very trying period in its ecclesiastical and national histories. As you have engaged in this pastoral ministry, you have your beatitude, acted exactly as your name would lead us to expect you would. Anastasius. Anastasius. Your very name speaks of the central truth of our faith and of the promise that that faith offers to believers. Anastasius. Your name speaks of and points to the resurrection. And your ministry has done the same thing. Throughout your life, you have sought to bring new, graced, and blessed life to a struggling church. And you have brought the peace of the assurances that the resurrection brings to all of the members of the flock to whom you have ministered, and to whom you have ministered with holy constancy, great compassion, and remarkable effectiveness. Therefore, your beatitude. Fordham is honored this night beyond words to welcome you into its family and to hail you as a doctor of humane letters under its counsel, and therefore a most worthy companion of the angelic doctor, Thomas Aquinas, that Dominican theologian whose feast we, even Jesuits, celebrate with great enthusiasm this night. God bless you. Thank you, Father. We are honored to have His Eminence, Archbishop Demetrius, Primate of the Greek Orthodox Church in America, and himself a 2007 Fordham Honorary Degree recipient. He joins us this evening. Will all please rise as Archbishop Demetrius gives the invocation? It's a great honor as a member of this university to offer the invocation, especially in an occasion when the university honors Archbishop Anastasius of Albania, with whom we have been working since our student years in Athens, immediately after the Second World War. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Eternal, omnipotent, and merciful God, creator of the universe and of all things visible and invisible, inexhaustible source of wisdom, knowledge, and science, we praise you, we bless you, we offer thanks to you and we worship you for your great glory. You brought us into existence and gave us the opportunity of a life in freedom, of an education of excellence, of the gifts of your joy, love, faith, and peace that surpass every human desire. You gave us in your multitude of blessings, occasions like the present one, when a great university, serving in ways of excellence, the transcendent ideals of education, science, arts, and philosophy, honors a great contemporary hierarch of the Orthodox Church. Tonight, O oh God, 
a renowned, the renowned for the university, honors a most faithful servant of yours, Archbishop Anastasios of Albania, an outstanding scholar, a visionary theologian, a resourceful pastor, a missionary, and a strong supporter of continuous dialogues among religions, cultures, and ethnicities. Tonight, we humbly ask you, Lord, to bless abundantly this Fordham University, Father President Joseph McShane, the trustees, the deans, the professors, the students, and all who offer services in this university. We also humbly beseech you, O oh God, to protect your, your ineffable grace, your dedicated servant, Archbishop Anastasius, and his people of the Autocephalous Orthodox Church of Albania, so that they successfully continue their exemplary work as witness of the gospel of Christ for the benefit of all people and the glory of your holy name. <coughs> Amen. It is my distinct pleasure to now call Archbishop Anastasius forward. I also invite the Secretary of the Fordham University Board of Trustees, Nora Gross, Father McShane, and faculty sponsors, George Demacopoulos and Aristotle Papanicolaou, to come forward. Father President, I present to you his beatitude, Anastasios, Archbishop of Tirana, Doris, and all Albania, to be awarded the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Today, Fordham is proud to honor his beatitude, Anastasios, Archbishop of Tirana, Doris, and all Albania, an inspirational leader who is always willing to go where God calls him, whether it be East Africa or Albania, where he triumphed in resurrecting the Orthodox Church after years of tyrannical communist rule. Anastasios Yanolatos was born in Piraeus, Greece, and studied theology at the University of Athens. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1964, and from 1972 to 1992, served as professor of history of religion at the National and Capistrian University of Athens, where today he is Professor Emeritus. He helped revive Orthodox missionary activities in Greece and organized the Center for Missionary Studies at the University. In 1972, he was appointed General Director of the Publishing Office of the Church of Greece, where he also established the Inter-Orthodox Center of Athens. He has held several leadership positions within the World Council of Churches. From the 1960s to the 80s, his Beatitudes commitment to serving the faithful abroad brought him to Africa several times, culminating in his service as acting Archbishop of the Holy Metropolis of Aeronopolis in East Africa. There he founded the Patriarchal Seminary, where he ordained 62 African priests and plus 42 reader catechists from eight African tribes. Elected by the Ecumenical Patriarch as Archbishop of Albania in 1992, he has, under tremendously difficult conditions, restored the Othocephalous Church of Albania, which has been dissolved for many years under the communist regime that outlawed religion of any kind. Since his election, his beatitude led the effort to build or rebuild hundreds of churches 
including the resurrection of Christ Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Tirana, one of the largest Orthodox cathedrals in the world. He built a theological academy in Duras and ordained 145 new clergy and founded an orphanage, several schools, and Logos University. He also promoted the repairing of roads, aqueducts, bridges, and clinics, and collected contributions to restore a mosque. Under his leadership, the church distributed hundreds of tons of food and supplies to refugees of all faiths and ethnicities, especially during the Kosovo crisis. He has struggled tirelessly and helped relieve tension in the Balkans. And in 2000, he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. His Beatitudes studied the world's religions, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Islam, and African religions in several countries. His commitment to inter-Christian dialogue has earned him international recognition. He speaks four languages and reads five. He is the prolific author of numerous publications, including a respected study of Islam in 1975, the first to be published in Greece and the first ever by an Orthodox theologian. For his indefatigable commitment to Orthodox Christians, and his contributions to the peaceful coexistence of peoples of all faiths. We, the President and Trustees of Fordham University, in the solemn convocation assembled, and in accord with the charter of authority bestowed upon us by the regents of the University of the State of New York, declare his beatitude Anastasius, Archbishop of Tirana, Dures, and Ul, Albania, Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa, and that he may enjoy all the rights and privileges of this, our highest honor. We have issued these letters patent under our hand and under the corporate seal of the university on this, the 28th day of January in the year of our Lord, 2014, the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas.
So we hail an archbishop as Maxius. There's something wrong. <laughs> But you would agree with me, Oxus, no? Oxus. My dear friends, uh, now that we have welcomed the Archbishop into the Fordham family, it's my great honor uh, to introduce him. Uh, he will speak this evening on sharing the good news in a multi multi religious country, theological reflections on other religions. My dear friends, his beatitude, Archbishop Anastasius.
the missionary effort started in 1991 to rebuild the Orthodox Church of Albania from the ruins left behind by the atheistic persecution. I shall also refer to the harmonious coexistence of our church with the Muslim majority of the country and also with all the other Christians. In the second part, I shall limit myself, I shall omit some uh, passages for the sake of time, and I shall limit myself to three key biblical concepts which advance our theological reflection. It is my conviction that theological thought provides a stable ground for missionary ministry and pastoral outreach. And by the same token, that missionary ministry and pastoral effort revive theological thought. The reconstruction of the Orthodox of the Treasury of the Venezuela, its ruins. Until 1990, I had not dealt especially with Albania. My interest had focused on Africa. And I was in Kenya in early 1991 when I was informed that the Holy Synod of the Patriarchate of Constantinople appointed me patriarchal exile in Albania in order to explore what remained after the totalitarian atheistic persecution and what would be done for the reconstruction of the Church of Albania. In July 1991, I arrived in Tito. We were greeted at the airport by a small group of elderly and tormented people who led us to the ruined old cathedral, which for decades had been used as a gymnasium, as a gym. From that very first moment, I wanted to define the essential message of my mission. So I asked everybody to take a camera and ask how they say the words Christ's reason in Albania. I proceeded to light the candle, chanting Christi Ungial, that is Christ's reason. One after another, the faithful few that were present lit their candles and responded in tears with the words verted in God, truly his reason. Since then, the phrase Christ's reason became the motto with which we have carried on all these years of difficulties and problems. On June 24, 92, at the suggestion of His All Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, the Holy Synod of the Patriarch of Constantinople, elected me Archbishop of Tiran, Dures, and Poland. The ground was extremely slippery and hostile. The old system of the atheistic regime remained very strong and active. Their mistrust of Greece, where he was born, was hardened, and so failure was sure. Finally, after 18 days of agony and prayer, I decided to accept the risk with the conviction that the most crucial issue at that historical moment was obedience to the will of God and not any success in itself. In the spiritual life, what is particularly important is freedom from fear. Love casts out fear, even the fear of failure. The primary concern of a Christian missionary effort throughout the centuries has been the erection of places of worship in order to celebrate the Holy Sacraments and thanksgiving to God. Thus, we began a systematic and persistent reconstruction 
of destroyed churches and constitution and construction of new ones. We repaired 160 churches, another 150 new ones were built, many of them quite important and imposing in their structure. The new cathedral in Tirana is considered as one of the most beautiful buildings in Albania. I insist that truth, love and beauty have to coexist in any Christian effort and mission. At the same time, 60 destroyed cultural monuments were restored and 70 buildings were established for the administrative and activities of diocese, school, medical centers and various institutions. I omit many, many in order to be a little more faithful to time. Meanwhile, our attention focused on the creation of local clergy. A seminary started functioning in 1992 in a hotel. After five years, it developed into theological academy. In the beginning, the hotel we don't have, we did have water, we did have electricity and good food, but it was a very important step. And now, the theological academy has also its campus, and we hope to develop more in the university. Over 150 Albanian clergy were prepared. Also, we studied the Holy Synod, and we are so happy because the emphasis was on local people. It organized about 460 parishes in various cities and villages. One large vacuum in our church was the lack of Christian literature in the Albanian language. We began working systematically our translations into Albanian and created a publishing house with its own printing press. We also established a radio station, website, and means for social media. We turned our attention especially towards the young generation. Thousands of young people responded to our call, and as we often repeat, young people are not just the future of our church, but the present. Along then with the reconstitution of the church, we try to have some social initiatives in the various aspects of our Albanian society. For instance, first, in matters pertaining to social welfare, offering thousands of tons of food, clothing, and medicines. Second, in the health sector, creating four clinics and the diagnostic medical center, which in the last 12 years was served over 1 million. 300,000 patients, regardless of their religious beliefs. Third, in the field of education, establishing kindergartens, elementary and secondary schools, professional institutes, and recently, the university. Fourth, in rural development, instituting programs for water supplies and roads, as well as fifth, in culture and ecology starting new initiatives. With all these activities, the church conveys the gospel of love, whether silently or symbolically, to different levels of society. Furthermore, as it is already said, in 1999, when thousands of refugees from Kosovo, all of them Muslims, came to Albania, the Orthodox Church collaborated with other European churches supported and assisted some 33,000 refugees. All the aforementioned projects were completed with generous donations of many millions of 
dollars from numerous sources. In order to gather all these resources, the Archbishop was obliged to become an international beggar. To the thousands of known and unknown donors, our thanks are profound. Christians and Muslims agreed that in the modern free society we must articulate and cultivate moral values of common concern. Among all and above all, we must develop the conviction that humanity is not independent in the universe and that the individual interest as well as the worship of money, pleasure and power cannot be the new idols, the only criteria for the contemporary society. Finally, religion cannot be allowed to become inspiration of terrorism and violence. Personally, I have never refrained from repeating that violence in the name of religion only violates the essence of religion. Our stable common ground was the acceptance of freedom of conscience and the emphasis on the various international declarations. Thank you. 
might be also came from the one part of human beings created by God. Therefore, all people, regardless of race, color, gender, language, and education, are endowed with the dignity of divine origin. The human being was created in the image of God and called to move towards the likeness of God. While proclaiming the Christian faith in the multi-religious society of Albania, we stress that the gospel is not another theory, another system of thought, but the preeminent news, the good news, that the Son and Word of God, who became human and arose from the dead, is always with us. The Christian faith stresses the incarnation of God, who is love, but at the same time offers divine, divine grace, a <coughs> transformative journey, deification by grace. Obviously, every person is free to accept or reject this message. But Christian revelation continuously proclaims in love with the assurance that the freedom of love is never bound by the beliefs of others. St. Maximus of Confession affirms, I quote, bless this divine who is capable of loving everyone equally. We generally found that the specific issues leading to creative dialogue among the different religious communities between the various religious in general include the protection of natural environment, discouraging violence everywhere, reconciliation among nations, development, global justice, bioethics, and especially peace in the local and global level. In the second part, I had prepared two special uh, issues. The first, about the theological understanding of other religions with the base of the Holy Trinity. But I jump all this special and I go at the end. <laughs> Emphasizing the phrase extra ecclesia nulla salus, outside the church there is no salvation, was born in the West. It never constituted the center of his theological thought, even if it was adopted in a limit and specific sense. On the contrary, both older and recent Orthodox theologians stressed that the grace of God acts even beyond the limits of the visible church. A renowned theologian and academician, the late professor John Carmelis, boldly expressed the following view at the end of his life, because he was very, uh, very conservative. I quote, not only Christians, but also non-Christians, unbelievers, and pagans can become fellow heirs members of the same body and partakers of the same promise in Jesus Christ. End of quote. Thus, rather than stressing the negative outside the church, I believe that Orthodox theologians today underline the more positive through the church. Salvation occurs 
in the world through the church. As a sign and image of God's kingdom, the church is the unitive type axis of the entire process of recapitulation. Just as the life of Christ, the new Adam, was global, has global consequences, so too the life of his mystical body, the church, has global reach and power. Its prayer and concern embraces the whole of humanity. The church offers the Holy Eucharist for the ecumenic, for the whole world, acting on behalf of the whole world and radiates the glory of the living Lord to all creation. The Orthodox stance is uh, critical of other religious and philosophical systems and or as organic unities. However, with regard to people living within the religions and ideologies, it has always retained an attitude of respect and love in accordance with Christ's example. By preserving the divine image, human beings continue to receive the messages and energies of the divine will, but often is not capable a human person of perceiving this correctly. To use an imperfect analogy from modern technology, if a television receiver is not well connected, transmits deformed images and sounds. In fact, many audio and visual distortions may be due to various faulty transmissions. In my final section, I will focus on three critical <coughs> concepts which I believe open the horizon of our thought. In considering the universal religious experience, these are Logos, Agape, Force, <coughs> Word, Love and Light. Let us start with the first. The term Logos, Word, invokes a vast wealth of human thought, known as Logos. In pre-Christian era, it is widely used in Greek philosophical terminology. Despite external affinities with ancient Greek philosophy and Jewish developments by Philo of Alexandria, the term word logos assumed new meanings in John St. John's Gospel and explicitly new theological content. The word is Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, the light of the life of humankind, who was incarnated for the salvation of the world. The apologies of the first Christian century, century developed with particular attention these teachings about the Lord's world offer significant theological opinions. Most of them, in referring to the relationship of the Logos to the Father, adopted the model of the immanent and spoken world. It is well known that the philosopher Justin Martin, uh, Martin Justin, wrote, quote, all written writers were capable of seeing everything darkly through this permetipos globus, the germinating principle that unites them all. I pass other quotation and I insist in this, those who live in accordance with the laws are Christians, even if they are regarded as atheists. Clement of Alexandria speaks in similar fashion 
when he speaks that philosophers receive, quote, sparks of the divine logos, of the divine world. This is how he understands both the capacity and the limitation of Greek philosophy. He believes that, I quote, philosophy seeks to know the truth. For him, in the ancient history of religion, knowledge of truth comes directly from God. <coughs> Indeed, he calls it, I quote, a preparation for the fulfillment of Christ. For the historian Eusebius of Caesarea, quote, the heavenly word of God guides humanity by acting over all and for all, while also granting an intellect to the people as a guide to seek his wisdom. End of quotation. Eusebius accepts the universality of divine revelation <laughs> to all nations and all people, acknowledging an inner religious experience everywhere all God-loving people of all ages, quote, who are witnesses to justice, are considered Christians in practice. Equally inherent as human reasons are the wisdom of peoples, the institution of moral regulations, and the wider search for truth. As in Paul writes, Hope for what can be known about God is plain to, him, to them, because God has shown it to them. Every sin in the creation. I don't go more, you know, this famous chapter in the Proverbs letter. Referring to persistent human search, of truth, St. Gregory of Nyssa, who will then declare the discovery of God lies precisely in the constant search. The search is not defined, it's not defined. And St. Paul emphasizes that the conscience guided this innate moral law is also related to the world. We remember this famous passage when Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature what the law requires, they are a law of themselves, even though they do not have.
Christian teaching about love. One of the most exceptional and beautiful verse of ancient Greek literature is found in the tragedies of Antigone by Sophocles. My nature is not to hate the others, but to love them. Uti, in the original Greek, Uti synechtin, ana synthilin efe. Then he did it again, and he saw it again again. The complete and final definition of love has been given by our Lord Jesus Christ. He reversed positively the old principle of the God rule. And as you wish that men would do, do so to them. And he has expanded in the parable of the good Samaria, an adherent of another faith, as well as in the image of the last judgment. And of course, we have the ultimate example of his life and death in the cross. Wherever then such behavior exists, the human heart is mystically coordinated, tuned with the divine. <laughs> And the last key, force, light. We have also beautiful light here. Almost all religions have as their basis, basic position, the concept of life and its relationship with the supreme being. The concept of life was adopted in a direct way by Jesus Christ as the world by whom all things were made, and as the second person of the Holy Trinity, Christ was the light which enlightened every person coming into the world. He also and peacefully declared, I am the light of the world, a light that directly related to life. At the end of the history of salvation, creation will have God himself as its life. We Christians proclaim that Christ is light from light, that the entire Holy Trinity is light, the Father is light, so do the Son is light, and the Holy Spirit as well is light. The nature of created light has always been the focus of scientific research. In fact, scientific progress is associated with this research. The new scientific achievements, along with the surprise that they inspire, further broaden the biblical concept of life and the allegorical implications of the unimaginable scope of the uncreated or pre-existed life of Christ. The explosion of scientific knowledge in relation to the nature of created life offers new dimensions for the symbolism of the amazing energies of divine life in the world. The quantum of light, the elementary particle of light energy, the photon holds a special place among the molecules of matter and energy that make up the world. In the form of photons or electronic waves, light exists and acts even in the most remote areas of the universe, far beyond our imagination, even in what we believe to be darkness. In similar fashion, the divine light acts even in situations, persons, and places which the human brain cannot imagine. The light of Christ, the light of the Holy Spirit, is understood 
as known with regard to its energies, but like the natural light. Nonetheless, it simultaneously remains incomprehensible and inaccessible with regard to its essence. God is called light, not in regard to his essence, but in regard to his energies, as St. Gregory Palamas says. And while God's essence remains inaccessible, all those who desire it can participate in its energies, provided that they have the will to receive it.
who has given up his mind to the cult of the Christians or to the religion which he personally feels best suited to himself. <coughs> Inspired by the words of his beatitude Anastasius and in the spirit of religious toleration and church unity, let us pray. Lord God, whose blessings reach to the ends of the earth, you show us your love in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, whom we call Savior and Lord. As we gather here, many of us followers of St. Peter and St. Andrew, brothers, apostles, and martyrs, may our union in prayer strengthen our striving for unity. Confirm us in our common faith that together we may give witness to the gospel and share the good news. Send your blessings upon your church, that what we have begun in the Spirit may be brought to completion by your power. To you be glory and honor, now and forever. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We ask that you remain seated during the recessional until the platform party has left the church. First though, on behalf of the President and the Board of Trustees of Fordham University, I extend our thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. As we conclude the formal portion of the program, I hope that you'll be able to join us now at a reception in Tognino Hall of Duane Library. Thank you very much.